terms, I know who has seen it, but when he saw it, he didn't get to take a copy of it. He didn't get a chance to take it and digest it. He basically showed it to him and he gave it back to him, and that was it. And that was a good friend of mine named Alan Grace. Mm. Now, several of us, following Alan's good example, have demanded to see a copy of ourselves, and we're writing letters asking about provision, certain provisions of it. Asking, what, 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 what about parts of this thing? What about uh, uh, labor standards in Vietnam? What about labor standards in, in, in the various 11 countries that are going to be part of this thing? And, and how uh, are we going to make sure that environmental and labor standards are maintained in a way that they basically are not extracting cheap goods from people's uh, suffering? Then, then, then they should sell here and reduce our wages and even put us out of work. So this is the question that we're asking. So rather than coming full flat out and saying, kill it, and I'm not against killing it, I actually I think it'd be a good thing if you look at if you look at the way we fared with these trade agreements. My first call is let's see it. Let's have some transparency. If it's so good, why are they keeping it hidden? Who's and, they? Well, the USTR. US Trade Representative. Corporate corporate big way. Well, the U.S. Trade Representative for the United States government. government. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I think okay. I said yeah, right? Okay. So, so my point is that that's the day. And the day is uh, there are 600 business advisors who do get to look at it, but we don't get to. We huh? know who they are. Yeah. You, yes, Monsanto. I mean, you mean there? Monsanto's not the government. Okay, let me finish, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so my point is, we're here today to try to shine some light on this thing, to get some facts out on the table, and if this trade agreement does not serve the American people's interests, to stop it. To set up a new trade model that rewards, that rewards country, companies that promote jobs in our own country. And if we're going to have trade, make sure it's trade between countries that have labor standards, environmental standards, real standards in which we do not take advantage of people in other countries, or corporate America doesn't take advantage of, of, of people in other countries and sell us that stuff here. Holding our wages down, laying off our workers, all so they can pay somebody a dollar a day in factories that are literally collapsing. I mean, if you look at the labor standards in many of the countries that are that, that, that are party to this Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, I mean, many of them have really, really abysmal labor standards. Vietnam, for example, seriously bad labor standards there. People getting paid uh, literally like a, like a dollar and a half a day uh, to make goods that you and I are going to be asked to purchase, laying off our textile workers, and then, of course, threatening us with leaving if we say that we need a better pay and better, and, and better working conditions here. How many communities across America told that if you don't accept some concessions in your work contract, we're taking it abroad? And then when they go abroad, it's not like the people over there are living in roses either. So let's say, you know, like for, you know, and I'm telling you that I look, NAFTA, Minnesota has been a net loser for NAFTA. We have not gained because of NAFTA. The Korea, the South Korea Free Trade Agreement, they're unloading Hyundais there, but how many Fords we selling over there? We have not, we have a big trade, I'm almost done, big trade gap with them. So today, today I want to ask you all for a few things. I want to ask for your attention to this trade deal. Mm. I didn't come to you today because I know every single thing about it. As I told you, it's been secret. Attention. Number two, I want to ask you for your activism around trade and to talk to people in your, in your union, in your neighborhood, in your bowling group, everywhere, in your faith community, everywhere. And then third, I want to ask you for your inquisitive, questioning mind, because I'm telling you, 
the first thing is gonna we're gonna see is we're gonna see uh, a, a very uh, a very quick vote on something called fast track, and you're gonna have to start asking questions. I'm, I'm asking you to ask them now, so that when they, we get a fast track bill, which is gonna give the president trade promotion authority, which means they're gonna we're not gonna be able to offer amendments to the TPP to make it better. We'll just have to vote on it up or down. Members of Congress will be told that if they don't vote for it, they're anti-trade, they're protectionists. And you, people are going to, I'm telling you, people are going to vote for it. The time to slow this train down and get some shots, sunlight on it is now. We want people across the country doing here, doing uh, meetings like this and putting and, and, and getting the, and saying to their members of Congress, have you asked to see the TPP yet? What's in it? How do we know that? How do you know that? Remember how they said during the health care bill, have you read the bill? Well, I did read the bill. Guess what? The bill was published for me to read. <laughs> this one's not. So we need your help on this thing. I'm telling you. Uh, if, if the American people say, how is this going to deal with textiles? How is this going to deal with finished products like, uh, you know, like manufactured products? What about ag products? What about labor standards here? What about environmental standards? What about patent stuff here? What about, what about Buy American pr provisions? This TTP will ban Buy American provisions. And if we have them anyway, foreign countries will be able to sue the United States and get expected profits. Does that make sense to you? And so, look, we're going to talk more about it, more about the facts of it. I, I want to let you know that in, I think, July 15th, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there's going to be round, round 15 of these negotiations is going to take place in Malaysia. Anybody know anybody in Malaysia? <laughs> if you've got friends or kids or somebody who's living in Malaysia, good time to get on the phone with them. And I'm telling you, this is a time for workers in America and Malaysia and Vietnam to figure out how we can talk to make sure that we all have some economies and some societies that make sense as opposed to declining wages for all, declining working conditions for all, infringement on our national sovereignty for all, and do something about this problem before it's too late. And so uh, with that, I want to um, just say thank you all for being out. Uh, attention, activism, and your inquir inquiring, inquisitive mind. Those are three things we need from you as we move forward. Oh, last thing, I was in a meeting recently with some people who represent uh, a, a, a particular business, and they wanted to know all about our position on TPP. And they were saying that they get a lot of their goods from there, and that they sell here. But without you buying those goods, they wouldn't make a penny. So my thought is, why won't they hire? Why won't they make them here? Mm -hmm. Right? So with that, enough for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Congressman. We will have lots of time for question and answer, and I hope some of your questions will be answered with our next couple of speakers. Um, Next up uh, is Jim Hartness, who's the president of the International, uh, sorry, I always say International, Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Uh, IATP has provided a lot of intellectual heft on trade policy over the last uh, however many years uh, of its existence, um, and you know, is really leading the way, especially on our food systems. Um, just real quickly, uh, as an anecdote, one of the things they're talking about is safety for uh, fish. Uh, and what they want to do is want, they want to have fish that comes into the United States have the same, go through the same inspection process that it goes through in Vietnam. Be inspected in Vietnam and they'll treat that as having been inspected in the, in the United States. So there's just a wide array of things uh, that are in the TPP. Um, you know, it, it covers so many things. Uh, we're really lucky to have Jim here to talk about the food and environmental aspect of it. Thanks, thanks a lot for coming out. Um, thanks to uh, the Labor Federation for hosting this and for Congressman Ellison for uh, calling us all together. 
Uh, I wish I could say I felt lucky to be here, but uh, our organization was hand-in-hand uh, -hand with labor and environment and faith communities and a lot of others fighting NAFTA. Uh, and now here we have what they call NAFTA on steroids. Um, and so uh, I think Keith is absolutely right. We need to just uh, start asking questions real loud now before Fast Track uh, is approved. Um, and there are so many questions to ask. Um, it is secret on purpose. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative has said it. Uh, they asked him why it's secret, and he said because it probably wouldn't pass if it wasn't. I mean, it's that, it's that transparent. I mean, that, that part of it is transparent. I want to talk a little bit about the ag and food aspects of this. Um, but first of all, there are parts of it that are like a traditional trade agreement where you're trying to reduce tariffs and all that sort of thing. And um, uh, dairy is one of the most important of those. The US and New Zealand governments are dead set on eliminating all barriers to trade in milk and dairy products between all of the participating countries. And there are an awful lot of family farmers uh, and dairy workers in the US and in Canada and in other TPP participating countries that are fighting against that. And the reason is that they believe, and we believe that too at ITP, that nations should have the sovereign right to manage their own food supply. Um, I, I think that a lot of the farmers and workers that are looking at dairy trade being deregulated are thinking about the experience of NAFTA and thinking about what happened in Mexico and in the United States. After NAFTA, um, US grain corporations were able to export, were able to dump, corn in Mexico uh, at, at less than it costs to grow it here in the United States. And as a result, two million Mexican farmers were pushed off the land. All right, so, you know, the, uh, our, did I say our exports quadrupled? So US exports of corn to Mexico were equivalent of about 40% of their domestic production at the height of this process. And so, so farmers and people who are concerned about the dairy industry, and we have about 16,000 families that are farming, dairy farming in Wisconsin and Minnesota who are threatened by this, as well as, as many uh, around the country and in a lot of other uh, developing countries that are just trying to get domestic dairy uh, sectors going that would just be wiped out by the huge uh, multinational dairy interests. A lot of the agreement isn't about trade. It's actually about lowering standards so that corporations and investors have more access. Food safety, Josh already stole my thunder on, on fish, but the whole notion of equivalence is a very scary one. It's basically giving carte blanche to whatever the regulatory authorities are in whatever co other country you have and saying, yeah, you just do the inspection over there and you know, send us an email that it's OK, and then we'll let in all of the products that, that you want. Uh, this is a very dangerous path to take. Um, our own food inspection system is threatened enough by austerity and sequestration, but to actually accept something, you know, that we have no idea what it, what it is uh, as the equivalent of that is, is incredibly dangerous. But, of course, that's, that's also based on the notion that we have already in the United States. What, what do they say in uh, agribusiness? The safest and most abundant food supply on Earth. Um, well, I mean, I think that's true in some respects. But when it comes to the kinds of chemicals and technologies that are involved in highly industrialized crop and animal production, that's not the case. We have, we have abandoned the notion of uh, the precautionary principle. Right? This is something that a lot of countries, everyone in the EU and a lot of countries around the world use, that basically says, if you're going to release a new chemical or a new technology out into the world, the burden of proof is on you, the corporation that developed it, to show that it's safe. Right? It, it shouldn't be just released out there and then, well, if regulators or consumers or labor or environmentalists want it off, then you have to prove it's dangerous. That's a principle that's going to be undermined by this kind of agreement. And, and the US, unfortunately, has allowed a lot of chemicals and technologies, whether it's GMOs or different chemicals that are used for growth uh, enhancement in animal production, uh, things like unregulated unregul use of antibiotics uh, in animal production, things that other countries um, have wisely and through their democratic processes chosen uh, not to accept. And this agreement. And another just as scary one that's kind of the Tweedledum to TPP's Tweedledee, which is a free trade agreement with Europe, um, they, would, they would both uh, threaten those, those, uh, 
those types of provisions, voted in democratically, in most cases, by the governments of those countries. Um, another issue is this procurement issue in Buy American, and I'm sure we'll hear a little more of it about. Well, in the food and ag world, Buy American has a different name. It's called local, local food. It's called things like farm to school. We're in ITP, we're now doing farm to daycare, farm to hospital, farm to all sorts of institutions. That's using procurement and favoring your local producers in a way that provides fresh, uh, local, in many cases, sustainably produced food for children and at the same time helps your economy grow. That, that's a Buy American type thing that would be eliminated by this. The U.S. Trade Representative has a whole section on their website called Localization Barriers to Trade. Is that, is that scary or what? And so, and another element to that, of course, would be things like labels, right? You'd think that in a free country and in a free market, consumers should know where their food comes from, who produced it, how it was produced. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, uh, that could be market distorting, and uh, that's, that is also a localization barrier to trade that would be swept away by these kinds of agreements. So that's, the, that's why we need to ask these questions. And I, I want to I open it up to questions and comments and strategies, but there are two other really big elements of this. One that Keith mentioned is this, these investor state provisions, which are just terrifying and are already being used. The Philip Morris Corporation is now suing Uruguay for hundreds of millions of dollars because Uruguay's democratically elected government decided, you know what, our people are dying of cancer. We need to have some better warning labels on our cigarette packages. Well, Philip Morris said, well, we were expecting to make much higher profits by killing your people than we'll make if they decide that they might want to smoke so and not want to smoke so much. So you need to give us whatever it is, $600 million or whatever they're suing for. That's legal. And it's not happening in an Uruguayan court. It's not happening in a US court. It's three trade lawyers, right? And it's, you can't appeal. And, and that's what we're signing on to. So the, the, and the other thing has to do with finance. And again, I don't want to take up too much time. But you know, Dodd-Frank was not perfect. And it's been gutted by the House. No offense, Keith. No, was, I, I know it wasn't you. I was there when they did it. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's something. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, these agreements, these agreements, um, part of these agreements is to get around the, the few provisions we have left that are trying to rein in Wall Street and then rein in investors. Not just investor straight estate, but other types of regulations on the crazy rigged casino economy. So um, we got a lot of work to do. And uh, I'll hand it over to our next speaker. I was going to introduce this. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, and just two, two quick things on the investor state provisions. Uh, we, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, also has a process where countries can sue each other. Uh, in two recent cases, one in the United States, we had uh, banned flavored cigarettes. Well, the WTO said, no, you can't do that. That's unfair to Indonesia's clove production. So now we're not banning flavored cigarettes anymore. Uh, the other thing was country of origin labeling for meat, uh, like Jim said. Recently, the WTO decided, oh, well, you know, you can't know where your meat came from. So this is real stuff that's happening. This is not anything that's out here hypothetical. It's happening right now. Um, our next speaker is Rick Ryan of the International Association of Machinists. Uh, Rick has been fighting this fight on free trade um, at least since NAFTA. Um, and, and Rick was also very instrumental in helping pass the Trade Policy Advisory Council here in Minnesota. Um, that was just passed in the last legislative session so that we now have uh, a state-sanctioned panel that's going to be looking at these agreements and making recommendations to the legislatures how we as Minnesotans can engage on trade policy. So, Rick Ryan, come on up. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, Congressman Ellison. Um, so, the question would be, why is labor opposed to trade? Why do we hate trade? Well, we don't hate trade. We need trade. We have to trade. Uh, the products the, the machinist union makes, the things we do, we have worldwide markets for. What we're opposed to is trade that's based on uh, unfair and unlevel playing field. 
American workers are the most productive workers in the world. American workers, when you put in the cost of the labor component, can compete with anyone else. But what's happened in the last, uh, since NAFTA and, and then with CAFTA, with the Korea Free Trade Agreement, interestingly, our trade deficit in one year with Korea has increased by 24% since the passage of the Korean FDA. So it's not creating jobs for Americans. It's not creating uh, better conditions for Koreans. Who's, who's it helping? Who's, who's benefiting from these free trade agreements? Investors. <laughs> It's investors, it's the corporations, it's the top 0.1%, not even the 1%. The 1% isn't in this game, it's the 0.1%, or maybe the 0.01%. So, as we look at Trans-Pacific Partnership from, from our, our position with the machinists, we're seeing just more offshoring of our jobs, uh, with labor provisions that are still unacceptable, uh, labor provisions have never been acceptable in any of these agreements. There's no provisions for free trade unions. There's no provisions for uh, uh, child workers. There's no provisions for any of the things that we take for granted. Now, we look at what happened in Bangladesh several weeks ago, a terrible tragedy. <clears throat> but our underwear, we can get a 10-pack of underwear for $3. So hey, you know, it's a trade-off. Um, it's a 10 pack of underwear for three bucks worth uh, 3,000 lives. That's a question you can ask yourself. When we make purchases, we make moral decisions. We make a moral decision every time we shop. So, there's other issues with this. There's issues with the, the investment provisions the Buy America provisions, uh, some of the things that would happen, let's just say that, hey, you know, we're in Minnesota, we're in Minneapolis, we're pretty progressive. You know, we want to have, uh, we want to have new streetcars here. Hey, that'd be a great idea, transportation. And we want those streetcars to be run on green energy that comes from renewable sources. That could be against the TPP. Effectively, these rules control our tax dollars and transfer them into private units for corporate profit, eliminating important policy decisions and tools that we use to create a better society here. So it's not just jobs. It's not just uh, a political agreement, because a lot of this is about politics, too. It's about making these countries feel like they're part of it and, and creating more U.S. influence on this whole part of the world so we can have better control over everything. But it also is really about moral decisions. What do we do? Right? And you can ask yourself, what do I believe and why do I believe it? So what do I believe? I believe TPP is wrong. I believe that it's going to be bad for our country. I believe it's going to be bad for our world. Why do I believe it? The evidence has shown me from NAFTA, from CAFTA, from the Korean FTA, that these agreements don't help anyone except big corporations. And if that's what you want, that's great. If you're a shareholder of uh, Fortune 500 companies, and, and you, you know you've got millions of dollars invested in the markets. This would be a great thing for you. But if you're an average middle class or American, I think this is going to be bad. Or a so, private company like Cargill. Or yeah, privately held company like Cargill. Pharmaceuticals are in here too, right? We already yep. pay a time time of thousands of dollars. <laughs> and some of the other things that could be controlled by this. So. I guess my, my main point is we make decisions all the time. We make decisions on what car to buy, and what shoes to buy, and where they're made. And we can make a decision to buy stuff that helps people here in our own country, or we can make a decision that, to buy things that helps uh, big corporations. 
have more profits. I think we need to make ethical decisions. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to hand the microphone off to Congressman Ellison in a, just a sec for a question and answer. Um, but I did just want to make uh, two, two quick uh, points. Uh, the first was, uh, we talked about pharmaceuticals. When NAFTA was negotiated, we were largely dealing with the flow of goods and services across borders. When CAFTA came up, they started controlling how we spend our tax dollars through procurement. Now they're coming after our ideas, the stuff that's in our head. This is the first agreement that has an intellectual property chapter, um, and it could control patent extension, it can pr control your privacy on the internet, a whole array of, array of things. They're just looking for the next thing they can privatize and own. Uh, the second thing, both Congressman Ellison and Jim mentioned what's called fast track legislation. This is coming up. What, uh, I, I just want to take one quick minute to explain what it is. Under the Constitution, Congress is charged with ratifying trade agreements. What fast track does, and for those of you who are active in the DFL, you'll understand this, is Congress suspends the rules. Uh, they suspend the rules of the United States Constitution to give the president vast authority to negotiate these agreements, and then they say, we'll give you an up or down vote within 90 days of the agreement being submitted to Congress, and we won't make any amendments. That's coming up there. Uh, Chairman Bacchus on the Senate Finance Committee has said that he wants to introduce that this summer. So we have a fight ahead of us this summer. With that, I'll hand the microphone over to Congressman. Please have your questions. So look, you don't have to ask a question. You can just say your opinion. But I want to ask you all, because there's a lot of, lot of folks who want to say something, and I, we want to hear from everybody. Could we agree to just go a minute per person? Is that cool? Mm -hmm. If you agree to the minute, clap your hand. Yeah. Uh, I need to ask you one more thing, because this is we're, we're democratic in here. Can, will you all then pop small them? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because we need because we need everybody. Mike, you're right about that. So let me just say this: Will you all empower me to enforce the one minute? Plan? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. All right. So thanks a lot, and I'm gonna pick hands in the order that I see them. So if I miss you, it ain't personal. <laughs> We're in the back. Uh, stand up, stand up, and just uh, say your name. Yeah, my name is Eric Lido, and I'm the chief of staff of the National Health Supplies. And uh, my quick question about. Um, is do we have any indication on the TPP and their status on the forced privatization of a variety of public services? And I'm particularly thinking water, road maintenance, and things like that. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Do either one of you guys know? I, I can answer it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, it's, it's on the table. And from what I've heard, uh, in, so in the past, it's, it's been the federal government that's been bound by these procurement agreements. Canada would really like to get access to our state and local procurement contract. Canada wants to use the TPP to open up our public services to their private contractors. Um, that, that apparently is, is something that we've heard has been put on the table for the TPPs. So yes, absolutely. Uh, water, road maintenance, um, you know, a whole variety of the public services we take for granted could be subject to privatization. Thank you. Okay, so uh, on this side, uh, yes sir, glasses? Um, and it's my um, I, the thing that I always remember about NAFTA when I came through was the fact that it was a level uh, playing field. But one of the things is that uh, environmentally, there's all this devastation all over the world caused by this. Uh, and it seems like this is something that we need to connect the, the, the fact that these very unfair trade policies with the fact that we're also, you know, whether we, uh, when we don't, uh, we control the pollution here, and then we send it off somewhere else, and they throw it in the air, it comes back our way anyway. So, I mean, I think the thing is that we need to make these connections because everybody understands what they need to breathe in the air. And I think that uh, we've got so many significant um, uh, issues. This is a very important one. But I think we need to connect them. Uh, that's all. Well, me, I like to breathe several times. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to touch on that? Uh, yeah, I would just say, especially in light of climate change, People around the world are going to be needing to make changes and have new rules and new, new laws to deal with 
the effects of climate change that are already affecting the lives of billions of people around the planet, if they're, if they're in tra uh, investor state provisions, then you could be sued for, for saying, no, you can't cut down rainforest and grow oil palm for export. Um, because you, you might be in interfering with somebody's uh, expected profits. Good. Uh, now, we'll be, yes, sir. Um, I just want to point out, I haven't really learned much new here today, but I did hear about the TPP back in May or June prior to the 2012 election. Um, I, you know, I worked for the union back when we were coming up with the fake health care reform plan, the, the public option, which the Obama was building back in the deal. Well, you know, it's part of that. There you go. Um, if you're going to call yourself a negotiator, you should probably negotiate right before you give somebody $200 million. And I haven't heard a lot of talk about President Obama in this room. But if we continue, if we continue to reward failure uh, like this, we're gonna we're gonna keep, we're just going to hand over the fucking world uh, to corporate forests like President Obama. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So that's that's my comment. I hope labor unions will kind of realize that we can't keep repeating this pattern. Now let me just say this, everybody is welcome and you can say whatever you are inspired to say, but I do think that before we go too far, we should agree that we're going to try to be civil. civil. Now I'm not trying to protect anybody from criticism, including myself, but, but look, well, before we, see that's what I'm saying, we don't need an amen corner, but just say your views. And, and that's, is that cool? Yeah. yeah. All right, good. Uh, yes, sir. I'm getting, I'm, you're, you're going to be after him, okay? Go for it. I heard some serious accusation about the TPP in regards to the food and inspection of food being done overseas. That worries me. But the, my question is, uh, I mean, I, I kind of root, I think, I'm kind of skeptical that the FDA will give up their huge power to control inspection of food and uh, drugs. So my question is, uh, are you guys are positive about this? Because one of us have also mentioned that this uh, agreement is pretty secretive. So just uh, one second. Okay, anybody want to address? Skeptical that the FDA will give up their, their authority over food and drugs. Okay. Um. There's there's a lot. FDA is um, keep it civil, right? <laughs> there's, a bit of, there's a bit of a revolving door in the FDA, and and so I think and, and on on the one hand that I think means that uh, there is a certain constituency for the equivalence argument where where that authority could be given up. There is also tremendous pressure on them because their budgets have been cut so so far that they're not able to. Um, fulfill their like constitutional duties as it is. So, uh, so you're right that it's secret, and we don't know enough about the food provisions as we should. But, but we we have other cases like NAFTA, like other uh, bilaterals that we can go from. And Josh, I don't know, maybe you have more to add. Josh. Uh, yeah. Well, this is being negotiated in secret. There have been two chapters that have been leaked to the public. Uh, one is on intellectual property, and the other one is on investment. So we know that the, the protections for the pharmaceutical companies to extend their patents, and this is literally an example. If you have AIDS in Malaysia, you can get generic medicine for about $75 a, a treatment. Um, it's estimated, and I believe Doctors Without Borders did this estimate, that under the TPP leaked intellectual property chapter, your medication would go from $75 to $10,000 for treatment. Um, no joke. So uh, while it is highly secret, yeah, there have been a couple leaks. The investment chapter showed the exact same provisions that were in NAFTA. One of the things that we're trying to do is we're taking notes on your points today because we can write letters to the trade representative to demand information about particular chapters. And when we get it, you know, uh, if we're legally allowed to, we will, we will share it. Uh, and, uh, and, and we will certainly be fighting all the way. But these things that you're asking about, like your question, would be a good one to put to them. And we'll, we'll do that. So thank you for asking. Yes, ma'am, you're up. I just want to know what we're going to do. Because I think a lot of us already know, because I've known for months, but we 
what's going on, and I keep asking, when are we going to be getting together to make a difference? Not just writing letters, but you know, what are the unions going to do? What are all the progressive groups going to do? What are we going to do? For instance, we can't stop the Keystone. Uh, say he, Obama puts off his decision, this passes, then uh, our whole country could be sued. We won't physically stop it. Well, hopefully, but, you know, this is my question. What are the unions going to do? What are we all going to do? Well, this, I think, is a fair question, and, and if I may, I'll take a stab at it. We're here tonight. Let's be, let's be thankful for that. I am thankful. We got a room full of people who care about this issue. So that's, I think, doing something. We're gathering our ideas, we're gathering our questions, and there might be a number of great ideas that come out of here. One of the things that I hope that we do is for those of you who do not live in the 5th Congressional District, I hope you go home and write or call whoever represents you and say, we want a hearing in our district over this, and if they won't do it, then you set up one. So, <laughs> I, I hope that, you know, so, so there are a lot of things that we can do when we get together and start putting our heads together, like we're doing tonight. But, but one thing I want to say to you, and I think that, and I'm very grateful you said, what are we going to do? Because at the end of the day, that is the question, is it not? What are we going to do about it? So what we're going to do about it is we are going to reclaim economic justice in this country for working people. You want to ask why it is that your son or your daughter who went to college 25, 30 years after you did is not making what you're making when you got it, when you know, when you were their age, why they owe so much money, why their debt's so high, why public services have shrank? Well, it's because of offshoring and globalization unfairly done to us. It's because of destruction and attacks on labor unions. It's because of the loss of labor density and, and attacks on the uh, NLRB and the loss of, uh, of collective bargaining rights. It's a collection of things. And to fix it, we've got to fix each one of these. And trade is a good place to start rebuilding <coughs> the American middle and working class. So that's my answer to you. Let's, let's let our imagination be our only limitation. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have all the answers. I didn't come here because I had a, I came here to hear from you what we should do. So that's enough for me for now. All right. Uh, we, um, I'm looking for, I'm trying to get some gender balance, ma'am. I'm sorry, but there's a lot of, a lot of dudes up here with their hands up. Oh, well, there we go, right there. <laughs> talking a lot about monetary values, environmental values, but I'd just like to say something about overall human values. I mean, I see this as such hypocrisy. And the WTO, it seems like conservative values, like conservatives, you know. And um, when they were fighting education, and still fight education, they always talk about, oh, you have to have local control, local control, let your school board, you know, decide. And, um, and here, it's just the opposite. They're just um, disparaging local control, and that's just hypocrisy. And then um, I know um, they've complained about the UN, saying, oh, we're going towards one world government, you know, world order, or whatever. This is a world order that they're imposing. I mean, they're having this uh, little tribunal system or whatever be above all governments. So they're hypocrites as far as this one world order that they're always saying they're fighting, like having a healthy UN, you know. So um, it's just hypocrisy, and uh, it's, you know, Awful. <laughs> Did it all in 47 seconds. Can I say this? Now let me just say this. Look, I know I I ask I col I collaborate with folks to have this meeting today. But this is not a Democrat big D meeting. We need people from the right, from the left, from the anywhere. I don't care where you're from. If you're concerned about American sovereignty, if you're concerned about American wages and jobs, if you're concerned about food safety. We need to form a coalition to do something about it. Um, so, so what I want to, so what the reason I said that to you is because some of the people who say they're concerned about the UN, I want to go to them and say, how concerned about the UN are you really? 
Because if you're concerned about American sovereignty, so am I. Let's get together and, work and, and ask some serious questions about the TTP. Okay, uh, right back there in the green, in the green top. Yeah. I assume that it would. I can't say I know that for certain. Does anybody? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, here's what I know. I know that they're on um, that they're they're going to keep on having rounds of this thing until uh, they have a deal. Uh, the next one, as I said before, is in Malaysia in the middle of this month, and uh, they're going to they they're saying that they want to do something this year by the end of this year. So we don't know the exact date when the bill's going to drop in. We do know that from the moment that it's dropped in, that, that if Fast track passes, then we're on a clock, and it's a pretty tight clock, as a matter of fact. And uh, you know, um, so so yeah, go on with your point. Well, if, if for example, fast track comes into a committee, are there ways we can put pressure on that committee not to not to clear that? Too? Let me tell you, my friend, if fat, when fast track is dropped, we need to have mass rallies all over this country. We need to have people in the committee room. We need to raise it up and have some real national democracy, small d, going on, okay? And that's what we've got to do. So, so everybody needs to be like ready and warm. But how can they be ready and warm if they don't even know what TPP is or fast track? So that's one of the things we're doing today is trying to do share some education because I mean some folks may know all about it and other folks don't know anything about it. And so we're trying to get there. So let's look at back on this side. Yes, sir. <coughs> when candidate Barack Obama uh, said that he uh, would have a, the most open and transparent administration and that he would do things to help the middle class and working classes, so I can only assume that it's a double over there in Africa and that he is tied to a chair in the White House <laughs> and the trade representative is working over with a rubber hose. <laughs> You know what, um, I, I'm, can, I, can I answer that? My, my, here's my advice. Let's focus on trying to stop a bad trade deal. I'm not going to get wrapped up in nobody's personality. I'm not going to praise him. I'm not going to attack him. I'm worried about TPP. That's my focus. What branch of the government is doing TPP? I, for the third time, the United States Trade Representative. You were, you said let me just, let me, on the radio, Congress can't do anything. Let me just pick So people. it's the executive You know what, sir? Branch. I'm going to pick people who raise their hand and were duly organized. Is that right? Yes, yeah. yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so uh, thank you. Let's go back over here. Yep. Yeah, I think we should uh, make the point that, uh, talk about the rosy picture that Bill Clinton uh, said in NAFTA. First of all, he campaigned on fair trade. I was volunteering for Harkin, but the voters don't vote on issues. They voted on Clinton, good personality, and good looks. So we got Clinton. And he said, fair trade. I didn't like it. But then he passed NAFTA, which wasn't fair trade. So they don't do what they say. That's why I answer him. It's what they do. It's what you tell them. So when he passed NAFTA, he painted a rosy picture. We're going to get all these good jobs back. These white collar jobs are going to stay. We're going to get a lot of good jobs back. We got a big trade deficit right away from NAFTA. And he said that it's going to take care of illegal immigration. That won't be a problem. We got, he just said, two million Mexicans lost their, they couldn't compete with our mm -hmm. corn prices. It did the opposite. So it ain't what they say, it's what they do. So he, he lied to us, or he, I, I can just say he lied. So he, I'm not a politician, I can say that. So anyways, uh, and as far as the FDA, they ain't doing their job like they should anyways. They're corrupted with corporate, I had personal experience with that. I, I'm Mac depressive. I was treated with fluoridine for 20 years, so I got a personal grudge against what hey, happened to my me. My friend, I, I have to tell you this. That. I hate to take this with the church in the Okay, yeah, okay, and then um, I just, uh, there's something that comes to me today when you're talking about the TP. You're, 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 you're at the end of your time. Okay, well, I just want to take your time. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. You know what? Let me tell you something. If we get around, I'll come back to you, okay? Okay, I think I'll corporate. Uh, okay, we'll get back, back to you. Uh, yes, sir. Michael Mann, look more machinist. I support the sister over there, and the sister over there said, what can we do? Here's the deal. In Minnesota, we have 10 congressional uh, persons here. So I want to hear from Josh, and I want to hear from uh, Keith. What sense do you have the only way this bill will pass if he gets fast-track authority? So in Minnesota, we have 10 people, well, 
uh, nine people uh, who we have, or maybe eight people who we have to address. So what do you see happening, Keith and Josh, and the brother from IATP and Rick, to wage a full press campaign? I don't want to wait till we get to Washington in their Senate hearing. We want to prime them up once a month. What are you going to do? Make it hot, close, and personal. So get, give us some things that you think might be productive and fruitful to put the fear of Yahweh on the people they are not going to vote for right. track authority. Let me just tell you a few things that, that, I, that I'm doing. One, one thing is that, uh, you know, I, I can help call this meeting. Another thing is that I'm co-chair of something called the Progressive Caucus. We are having our own congressional hearing uh, meeting just like this one and we have uh, some, like the Teamsters are against it I think CWA is against it and we have others who are against it and they're gonna we're gonna do a thing on the hill so we can start getting the word out you'd be surprised a lot of members of Congress don't don't know that much about this thing don't blame them because they don't know it don't attack them I mean you know it's it's hard to know all the things that are going on it really is and I, I know folks are hard on Congress but I'm telling you You've got to, we've got to drive it up to, on their priority list. How are we going to do it? Having these Hill briefings. The other thing uh, that we're doing is that we're, you know what, I don't want to say some things we're doing on, you know, if they're not telling, I ain't telling. You turn off that screen and I'll, I'll tell you some more stuff. We're doing. <laughs> but, but, but put it like this, we, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out as much about this bill as we can. By writing letters, by, uh, by demanding information back, by getting as many people as we can to go see it, stuff like that. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, and with respect to one thing that you guys should to do tonight, if you live in the 5th Congressional District, you already have a supportive congressman. But you also have two senators, uh, uh, neither of which has taken a firm position against fast track. You can call both of them. If both of you, you know, if you, call, if you make two calls before you leave here tonight, we can fill up both of their mailboxes and maybe we can get someone to take a position. Can you provide their numbers? Yep. Uh, the the flyers have the congressional switchboard number on the back, but uh, we can we can definitely get you the direct lines to their offices. You kick Bachman in the Tea Party after. Actually, actually, that's exactly what I was about to say. Getting on to what one of the um, uh, other people raised before, you know, the the same people who worry about the UN also worry about the jackbooted Obama fascist regime, and. Maybe in this case they're right. <laughs> so, so right. So, 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 you know, in, in addition to two senators, uh, to get to your point, there are some congressional representatives who I think might make some unlikely but very effective partners on this issue. You know, Rick wants it. Yeah. This is about the corporatization of our country. Okay, and so. Whether it was Clinton or it's, uh, George W. Bush or now Barack Obama, and there are a few guys in Congress that are fighting this, but there's not many of them. Keith is one of them. Read the bill. Yes. You can't read the bill because we haven't seen the bill. Grayson has read it. He's one of the few, as you heard. Okay. So, you know what? I'd like to make right. my point. If yeah. I yeah. So, you know, yeah, there's political, big, huge political force behind this and huge money behind this, pushing this. And the only way we fight that is for us to mobilize and activate and do what we do, which is the grassroots stuff. We don't have that kind of money. You know, we're talking corporations with billions of dollars to spend. We can fight this by educating our people, we've been talking about TPP at our local meetings for a year and a half, at least. We bring it up all the time. We bring it up at all of our council, state council meetings. We're trying to spread the word for, through our members. We talk, you know, you need to talk to your neighbors about it. Talk to the people you see at church. Talk to the people you have coffee with in the morning. Whatever it is, get the message out. Because it's the only way people like us don't have the power, are going to get the power, is by organizing and making this an issue that they have to pay attention to. And if I may have one quick note, this is not an occasion to figure out who to blame. I'm not blaming you. No, 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 it's no. It's the way it Rick, is. Rick, 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 Rick. <laughs> I, I did not have you in mind, my brother. I did not have you, I swear to God. I'm talking, I didn't have anyone in mind. I'm, I'm just talking in general. 
Forgive me for, if there's even an implied insinuation that I had anybody in mind. I didn't. What I'm saying is, this is a time to come together as a community and to channel our energies on doing what's right for American workers. That, that is all you, I heard you saying. Absolutely. That's what I heard you saying. Um, uh, you know, right here, and I'm going to work my way back. Yes, sir. Um, Roger Kretman. I'm uh, curious with all the non-transparency that's going on. Is there any legal matter, any legal recourse that we can do to get, uh, be able to see the bill, to be able to actually get into it? I'm sure we thought of that, but by the response I'm seeing from the crowd here, it's all, you know, why, 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 maybe that might help dispel some of it. It's classified. That's why. Now, uh, is there a national public safety reason? I can't, I don't know why knowing what is in the fish would be a public safety danger. <laughs> Maybe not knowing what's in the fish is a public safety danger. It doesn't, it's irrational to me, to tell you the truth. I think it goes back to what, uh, uh, I'm not sure which one of you guys said it. We don't know what it is because we wouldn't support it if we did. You know what I mean? Because if, if, cause if you know, whenever they do something good, they want to brag about it, right? So why is it secret? I think demanding transparency is a very solid level. So uh, let's think about how we do that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just just so everyone's clear on the process, um, the executive branch of government is charged with negotiating treaties, and this is a treaty. Treaties override state, local, and federal laws. Um, the United States Trade Representative is part of the executive office. Uh, of the executive branch of the president, um, and so has diplomatic privilege, and that's why they're able to keep these negotiations secret. Now, the 600 cleared advisors that you've talked, we've talked about, 90 percent of which are from business and industry, representing corporate in interests, uh, they have lobbied the USTR to become cleared advisors, and so they're allowed to see different portions of the text. But you would literally be committing treason if you were to uh, see the text. And uh, and tell the public about it. Literally committing treason. Um, so, for example, Alan Grayson, uh, Congressman Alan Grayson, had to uh, go into a secure room, no notes, no recording devices, no nothing, uh, and then he was he looked at it, came back, and could ask questions. There have been other members of Congress who have requested to see the text, but the process for seeing it is long and arduous and extremely opaque. So, even though you know, you can say, read the, read the bill. Well, not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, I'm looking over here now. Yes, sir. <clears throat> also, while we're doing this talk that we're having, is very good so far, but I think we ought to take a bigger picture at the same time. And I wonder, over a period of years, I can see the corporation has gained more and more and more power all the time to the point they have now more power than the United States government. And we need to do something about that. We are going to lose our country to the corporation. And uh, you can see it now. And uh, just, uh, just a quick example, Amazon threatened Texas. You probably know all about it. You're going to tax us? Well, we're going to shut down everything. Our big warehouse lay off hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, so now they're squeezed. They're getting power. we got to do something. I don't know if Sherman Antitrust Act is still viable? I don't know. We, we need to do something. Is there any, do you have any ideas to limit corporate power to get it back in the box? Yeah, yeah we, we have a lot of ideas about limiting corporate power. Uh, and you're absolutely right to raise that. Does anybody want to address this issue right now? That's part of what we're trying to do. Um, but let me go on to some other folks who have a point they want to raise. Mike? Okay, um, thank you all for pointing out the fact that it was an evil Republican president that gave us not the cap to get the WTO, and it was an evil Republican president that gave us this particular trade treaty. Okay? Having said that, I work with Occupy Minnesota and with Idle No More. Okay? O Occupy Wall Street in this country was an actual movement that was actually starting to press and push things forward. And then it was the Obama administration that actually shut down with his Attorney General the Occupy Wall Street movement. And he got the aid and assistance of Democratic Party mayors, including Mayor Wright, R.T. Rayback, right here, to push the Occupy movement off the street. You want to know the way to move forward? Tunisia is showing us the way forward. Egypt is showing us the way forward. The people of Turkey are showing us the way forward. Occupy Wall Street came in because the current electoral system has failed us and has failed us completely. No more of this bullshit. Take to the streets. I'm done. 
Um, so, I'm one of the ones guilty of live streaming tonight. Um, so, I'm wondering if Congress is going to be in Malaysia on July 15th. I, I they, don't can't have all, they can't all accuse you of being treasonous, wanting well, to see it. Well, let me tell you, it's an interesting, interesting thought. But, you know, I mean, you might be surprised to know, but it's not that easy. To go for me to go to Malaysia, I know. right? I know. Uh, I know. But I tell you this: in this age we live, we've got to have some Malaysians and some Vietnamese folks and some other folks around this world who are as concerned about these issues as we are right here. I know for a fact that you are connected with Colombians who are concerned about the situation there. You know, we we've got to start figuring out how to reach out across this globe and say, "Hey, look, you know." This deal's not hot for us. How is it for you? And I bet you we'll find there's people around the world say, "Well, this deal kind of sucks for us too," you know. And uh, you know, they, you know, these little Bangladesh, they're, they're getting killed in collapsing factories. So, you know, um, we can get, we can try to get there virtually, and we're working on it. Um, and, and of course, there are people in all those countries that are pissed off about this too. So, uh, mm -hmm. the Asian Farmers Association. Uh, whose who's general secretary is on our board. They're going to be there. They represent 15 million farmers and peasants around Asia. Via Campesina is going to be there. The Third World Network just sent me an email with like hotel rates if I wanted to go. I'm actually going to be in Europe uh, the week after next talking with European groups about the FTA that the U.S. is negotiating with Europe because they have a huge, we're trying to push down their standards. Um, but I think we can't forget that we're the one, like, this is the country where this stuff is coming from. And it's our government and our executive branch that it's coming from. So we have a special <laughs> obligation and privilege to work on this issue. Yeah, sure. So I actually want to recognize myself as a person to ask a question. All right. You know, one of the things that concerns me is us uh, AIDS drugs. Right now, a lot of the people who are suffering from AIDS are getting generic drugs that are cheaper. If the TPP passed, would these folks perhaps face exorbitant prices for AIDS drugs? Oh. Yeah, I, as I said in the example, if you're getting a generic medication, it's about $75. Under the TPP, uh, it's being forced to buy brand name drugs that would go up to ten dollars to $12,000. So we're literally talking about people's lives here. But it's not just price of medication. It's extending the scope of what's patentable so that your surgical process is now you know, going to be patented so that you know if someone wants to you know perform surgery on you they have to go get permission from some other surgeon in some other country so I mean it's, it's just insane thank you for that yes ma'am hi my name is Gillette West I live in Minneapolis and I'm an activist uh, in the Twin Cities well I, I believe what we're really talking about here is global slavery but nobody wants to you know bring those terms to light and I'm always, it always surprises me that we never, uh, the people that make these decisions about things like TPP never believe that at some point they may find their head on a stick. They may be hiding in a hole and we may find them and pull them from that hole. I do believe that it's that serious of a matter. I was an, used to be uh, an advocate and still am for vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency. I'm one of the world's leading experts on vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency. And I fought the pharmaceutical company since, since uh, 2007. Um, the people that we're talking about that want these trade ag agreements put in place want to control the keys of life, the power over life and death. They want to control the atom bomb, and they'd like to control the nutrients that you put in your body, the food that you put in your body. It's a form of slavery, and, and we need to embrace all of the people of this globe. We need to stop saying, you know, stop saying the United States. If you look at these companies we're talking about, they are ruled by people that went to school in our educational institutions. They went to Harvard, and we need to hold those educational institutions responsible for that. Stop right, giving uh, money. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've been, uh, CWA, we've been being active with uh, TPP. 
I give, we have these cards, we uh, information about TPP. We give them cards, ask them to sign <coughs> these cards that we can give to their Congress people and senators. I had one that reads the nation, a person that reads the nation, so she's really informed, but declined to sign the cards because she doesn't know anything about it. Even though she got her 10 bullet <coughs> information about TPP that we're passing around, she still declined, and it's, we need public media. We need, we need, public needs to hear about it through the media, too, because it's just ourselves going to, to our neighbors, I think, is really hard, and they're going to, they're, you know, it's really tough. Well, well, let me tell you how the, the public media gets a hold of stuff. When, when folks like, like us in this room, we're tweeting about it, we're writing about it, we're streaming about it, we're having meetings about it, and we keep it up and we don't quit, we can impact the news cycle. But, we, but, but that's all part of it. We gotta do everything we're doing plus more to, to, to do what you're suggesting. So we, I think that uh, you know, we gotta give ourselves some credit for being here tonight, committing ourselves to raise these issues around trade, to committing ourselves to not quit, right? Just try to, try to keep some unity because unity is hard to keep sometimes, and 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 uh, and and that's the way to do it. And I think we will get some of those things because we're, sooner or later a reporter, maybe even sooner, is going to say it has trade. Have these trade agreements helped the American worker? Why do we have three decades of stagnant pay? Why is the income inequality so outrageously bad, worse than it was, um, you know, some just a few decades ago? So. I think we're getting there, but thank you for being here. I'm coming. Right over here. I'm Mark. I'm from Fridley. Um, I think we need to call it by its true name, TPP. Treason, pillage, and plunder. <laughs> and for anybody to say that this is new to them, that's not true. I brought this to your senior staff in your office when it was called the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement. Okay. They got, they got caught. You know, they had to rebrand it because we've been burned by that before. Ross Perot said that giant sucking sound coming out of the United States is going to be the jobs are losing to NAFTA, CAP, to GATT, and the WTO. So we've been there. We've done that. This is treason. This privacy. In the absence of Paul Wellstone, Ron Whiten is the guy you want to contact. He's the senator from Oregon, and he's the point man for this. And he does not have access to this information contained within these documents. We're, we've been sold out, we're selling out. We've spent $85 billion a month propping up Wall Street. One month put $85 billion into building infrastructure and creating jobs. Just one month, what that $85 billion would do. How many people know that? In the two hours we're here, $228 million dollars You got a minute, you got a minute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Trying to go back up, man, right there. Yep, you in the green. Uh, I have a question. So, Russell from Stillwater, and uh, I was wondering. I mean, I just really learned about this thing like, recently. And you said that two chapters leaked um, to the public. How exactly did that happen, and why is it not necessarily treason for us to talk about it right now? We can talk about it all we want, and uh, I don't know how it got leaked, right? Uh, but what I can tell you is that. It's uh, perfectly, it's our First Amendment right to discuss a matter of public concern, which is trade policy. And uh, to the degree that we have information that has come out about it, we should and we must discuss it. Yeah. Now, uh, so, is that, anybody want to? Uh, yeah. Um, literally the way is that one of the cleared advisors leaked it. So their anonymity is what's saving them from prosecution. Okay, yep, Bob All right. I heard you yesterday on uh, AM 950, you did a great show talking about this and uh, alerting the people, including me, about this meeting tonight. And one of the ideas here we're talking about is strategy. And I, I contend that the best uh, off defense is an offense. And to go after the people that are doing this. Now, uh, Mark already stole my thunder, but this is treason. Uh, you talked about this is uh, going to supersede our Constitution. And I want to know where the hell all these, these conservatives are, uh, yeah, whether Democrat or Republican, because conservatives, one of their, their primary principles is 
of defending the Constitution and enforcing that. And this is selling us all out. And so I think we, what we need to do to make that really painful for these people is to go after them and call them traitors for what they're doing. They're subverting the United States of America. Well, let me just say, if, if, if there are some people who are politically conservative, and if you disagree with them on 99 things, but you agree with them on this issue of national sovereignty, then talk to them about what you agree with them on. And for the ones who you agree, don't call them traitors because they might not appreciate it. <laughs> and, and, but, but, you know, so that's all I'm saying. I mean, let's reach out, build alliances where we can find them. You know, there are, there are, there are all kinds of coalitions that can be formed here, but they're going to happen because people of goodwill who love this country, who care about wages and jobs here, are willing to get outside of a comfort zone talk to people who they may not traditionally agree with, use a little diplomacy, and uh, try, to, try to build something that makes sense to help the American people. I'm just gonna say this, it is emotionally satisfying to call people names. It's, it's not the way to build a coalition. All right. Way in the back. <laughs> Speak up. Thank you. That, now that's a constructive suggestion. Thank you. Uh, let me let me just say um, we have about nine. No, excuse me, about eight more minutes to go. We're going to go to seven thirty. Uh, we're going to let we're going to try to get everybody in, but we can't do it based on one minute per person. So we got to go to about about. Uh, I mean, you got to make your point. We're going to do about twenty seconds per. All right, all right. Go for it. My name is Liana Gale, and I'm with the Green Party here in Minnesota and Temple. I have a written statement. I see TPP as the tip of the iceberg of all what is wrong in this world. So I think TPP represents a great opportunity for people and organizations to come together and to form coalitions. My hope is that we can start a mass movement providing a starting point for people to take back not just this country but the planet. And I think we have the moral obligation to finally put our foot down. Yes, sir. <laughs> to the um, trade agreements that we're seeking in the first person. Do you believe, as I do, that the Bill of Rights is a restricted clause in the government and so supersedes the law and then it will treat it? Anybody want to discuss that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know, let me tell you, I think the United States Constitution is the bedrock of American law. Next question. Right, go for it. Uh, I just want to throw up one thing, and that is the, uh, I don't know if people with the women's international fee for uh, uh, peace and freedom, and they have been involved in the Pacific Rim for many, many years, like I'd say 50 or more, and they also um, are deeply involved in the corporate power. They started 20 years ago uh, writing and doing plays about corporations, and I think that the, the power strength, I think would be a good one to do allies with. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Ma'am? Well, the one thing that makes me feel is back 
in 2004, 2005, when there was that big push to privatize Social Security. There were meetings like this everywhere, everywhere. And people woke up and they spoke up and we were able to stop it. And that's the one thing that What is your name? <laughs> Joy. I agree with Joy. Right in the best. I'm going to take this point and make a shameless self-promotional plug <laughs> for the Minnesota Fair Trade Coalition. We're coordinating the lobbying and education in the, in the state around trade. So please sign up for those lists, become a member of the Minnesota Fair Trade Coalition, get those updates, get those talking points, uh, and use the information that we provide to tell your friends and neighbors uh, about the work that we're doing. We have an event in Mankato on July 16th. Uh, where you know we, the Minnesota Fair Trade Coalition, is hosting a public forum. Um, you can also tomorrow tell your friends to tune in. Uh, and Steve, I'm just going to hand you the mic real quick. Josh, what's your position on Penny Pritzker? You know, you, you've all got the green flyers here. I just uh, one one thing that we can do. I just want to commend Josh for the work that he's been doing. I mean, uh, so I went to a meeting with him about a month ago where one of the things that he says is that we desperately need more people to get the word out about this. And every time I've had a conversation with anybody about it, people walk away outraged and they walk away ready to take the next step. So at Minnesota 2020, where I work, we're giving Josh a platform tomorrow from 9 to 10.30. He's going to be on there live blogging with us at www.mn2020.org. And uh, we'd love to see you there. And I want to challenge everybody, uh, don't just come here, the people who already know about it. Um, go out and talk to three of your friends who don't know about it. We're going to make it a really friendly, entry-level conversation so that everybody can get in there. And we'd love to see you tomorrow. Thank you, Steve. Um, see us afterwards. We'll give you the direct lines to the senator's offices. All right, so we're all, we got about three more minutes to go. We're going to try to get everybody in. And we've already done this side, so I'm coming from the back forward, okay? We're going to get everybody, but about 20 seconds, everybody. Yes, ma'am, in the back. You're wearing a gray sweater. My name is Yes, you're right. I gotta be honest. I don't know the truth. Do you negotiations know start the eighth of July. Negotiations start the eighth of July in Washington D.C. And we're organizing an event with uh, Sierra and Friends of the Earth and a number of our organizations there. Um, and yeah, shameless self plug www.iatp.org for more information. Okay, good. Glad y'all brought that up. I didn't want to divert the conversation with that, but it is an important point. I'm looking for hands coming forward before her. Okay, the gentleman in the black shirt. <coughs> Just a reminder, we're going to need in this coalition a whole lot of people that voted for Obama for sometimes sophisticated reasons, sometimes I think on the basis of uh, calculation of human decency. So uh, in the name of unity, let's not be bashing the people that voted for Obama. We may need them in this coalition too. Thank you for uh, for unity. We need all the unity we need if we want to win. Yes, ma'am. I'm with AFA. I live in Minneapolis. Um, everybody talks about a movement. Everybody talks about where to find things. If your friends, your family, your neighbors don't want to necessarily hear your side, you can Google anything. You can look it up. There's both sides on 
and you can have that information. When contacting your lawmaker, you might not like them, they might not be your party, but we have learned through things that we need to get done. They are our voice. Unfortunately, people, we are not always the voice. And if you want somebody to hear something, they may be the ones you need to go to. Call them, contact them, bombard them, email them, just inundate them with this, and they're there. Some of them come right. down, right? Thank you. Yes. Uh, we do this over and over and over again. We got, we got to move on. I'm sorry, we do have to move on right now. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah. Um, what are the penalties for uh, defined TPP rules, and how can they be enforced if a country or community says no to usurping of standards and laws at some point? Well, does anybody want to address that? Yeah. Um, I, Jim may have some perspective on that as well, but basically what happens is they're assessed a penalty that they have to pay. So, for example, Ecuador right now um, is, is, being, uh, is in a suit that could uh, assess up to 12% of their entire GDP, their entire education budget. Uh, so what, either what happens is they pay it or they face, face trade section, sanctions and they're not allowed to export anything to the United States. A lot of these countries join this agreement because, you know, we talk about, oh, the third world market is expanding. Well, every country in the world wants to sell to the United States. We're still the largest consumer market in the world. They'll do anything to have access to our markets. So, you know, that's a big deal for them. Okay, so, uh, uh, Carrie? Oh, well, his question was, if you violate TTP, TPP, what, what next? And the answer was, there's a, there, there's a suit for damages that the country has to pay. And then I suppose if they don't pay, there's an escalating trade sanctions that could be against them, including shutting them out. Uh, okay, good. So we're coming forward. Who else we got? You're the last one. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, well, Representative Ellison, uh, one of the immediate options you have is to propose a bill in the U.S. Congress. And so would you be possible to commit to posting a bill in the next two weeks that specifically says the trade representative can't hold secret files and that for more than a month, like, and because everyone in the United States deserves to have an equal opportunity to participate in treaty formation. So could you post a bill that would say that they couldn't hold secret uh, uh, working files of any sort, put that out there, and then see if people are willing to sign onto it? Because the structure of the system should be set by Congress, and they don't have the constitutional ability to be above Congress. Let me tell you this. It's a good idea. Uh -huh. I'll get with my colleagues, and we'll discuss whether that's the best most effective thing for us to do. Okay. But I'm working hard on this issue and have been. And I mean, yeah. I mean, I was a part of calling this meeting today. I was on the yeah. radio about it yesterday. We got a hearing coming up. So for you to like try to jam me into agreeing to something on the spot, sure. I'm not going to do it. It's an, idea, an idea. Yeah, thank you for the idea. Yeah. Is it, so look, we're, we're at the end of the evening, everybody. And uh, look, the way we're going to be successful is if we band together reach out to each other, look for positive solutions, build coalitions, and inform more people. We are going to have to be acting very quickly when the fast track comes up, and we're going to need a mighty wave of Americans to say no. So thank you all very much. One more talk to the Minnesota Fair Trade Coalition. Pay no slider. You can stay up to date on Facebook, on our website, on our email list. Thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah. 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 so much for addressing my question, but you, can you put the idea in the mix that this office shouldn't be secret anymore? You can put the idea in the mix. All right. For sure All right. Take it to the beltway. That's my suggestion. All right. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, that's Representative Allison. He, he won't commit right now to that idea of the bill, uh, but I'm, I do feel glad that I was uh, able to uh, put the idea forth, and uh, hopefully we'll get that idea in the beltway. Because clearly it's an asymmetrical uh, process uh, for the negotiation of these bills, and uh, you know, corporate America is getting that stuff. So anyway, here's the scene. Uh, we're down at the Minneapolis Central Labor Federation. Good turnout. Uh, clearly, uh, a lot of uh, occupiers uh, and occupy-friendly folks got here. Um, that clearly resonated. People talk about Tunisia, Turkey, stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think it was overall a really good meeting. So. Um, Maybe we can get one of those flyers.
this. Can I just uh, hold the flyer up? Okay, so the Minnesota uh, Fair Trade Coalition, uh, Josh Weiss, I think is the executive director right now. And so that's at, uh, you can reach them at mnftc at citizenstrade.org. It's also at mnfairtradecoalition.org. So uh, that's the organizational information. Um, I thought they did a really good job uh, raising these issues. Also, citizentrade.org slash trade slash fast track uh, covers the uh, fast track authority stuff going on here. So um, also the Institute, thank you so much. Uh, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy is based in South Minneapolis. Um, they've done a lot of good stuff, like uh, including the fair trade coffee and uh, raising awareness about a lot of different uh, economic uh, trade deals. Uh, good, good folks all around, um, and they're another group that's been involved in this. And uh, they've uh, we've been working with Occupy Minneapolis people here and there, uh, sharing ideas about what's going on. So anyway. Yeah, no kidding. We had Occupy St. Paul uh, speaking up, a guy from there as well. So, um, like, sorry, they were, oh Jesus, I got it. I'm almost out of power. But do you want to do you want to give a reaction about it? Like, at least at least it was a constructive talk. Like, I think that I shared that. The Congress thing was really cool. Yeah, we might not have any audio. It's a little loud. But, but I thought that um, it was very positive. I didn't see any negative.